I'm going to start by reading from um, my uh, first novel, Funny Boy. And um, I'm just going to set up the reading briefly and read from it. Um, Funny Boy is um, set in uh, Sri Lanka in the 70s and 80s within the milieu of affluent Sri Lankan Tamils living um, in Colombo and is narrated through the eyes of a young boy named Arji. Now, Arji is a little a bit of an oddity in his world because unlike regular boys who like to do regular boys things like play cricket or cowboys, what Arji likes to do is he likes to put on a sari and pretend he's a bride. And this, in fact, is his obsession, weddings and all the accoutrements surrounding it. So whenever the cousins gather together at their grandparents' home for what they call a spend the day, Arji organizes the girl cousins into a game called Bride Bride, which he is the bride. And this is absolute bliss for him. He puts on an old sari, attaches a lace curtain to his head and pretends he's a bride. Now into this world comes a cousin from abroad whom the other cousins promptly nickname her fatness. And her fatness, because she's the new kid, must play the most boring role in Bride Bride, the role that nobody else wants to play, which is, of course, the groom. Now, her fatness is not pleased with this situation, and I'm going to read you the part where the bride and groom finally clash. And the word Amma means mummy or mom in, in Sri Lanka. When lunch was over, my grandparents retired to their room for a nap. The other adults settled in the drawing room to read the newspaper or doze off in the huge armchairs. We, the bride-to-be and the bridesmaids, retired to the servants' room for the long-awaited ritual of dressing the bride. We were soon disturbed, however, by the sound of booming laughter. At first we ignored it, but when it persisted, getting louder and more drawn out, my sister Sonali went to the door and looked out. Her slight gasp brought us all out onto the porch. There the groom strutted up and down, head thrown back, stomach stuck out. She sported a huge bristly moustache, torn out of the broom, and a cigarette of roll paper and talcum powder, which she held between her fingers and puffed on vigorously. The younger cousins, instead of getting dressed and putting the final touches to the altar, sat along the edge of the porch and watched with great amusement. Aha, me hearties, the groom cried on seeing us. She opened her hands expansively. Bring me my fair maiden, for I must be off to my castle before the sun settest. We looked at the groom, aghast at the change in her behavior. She sauntered towards us, then stopped in front of me, winked expansively, and with her hand under my chin, tilted my head back. Ah, she exclaimed, a bonny lass, a bonny lass indeed. Stop it, I cried and slapped her hand. The groom is not supposed to make a noise. Why not, her factus replied angrily, dropping her hearty voice and accent. Why can't the groom make a noise? Because. Because of what? Because the game is called Bride Bride, not Groom Groom. <laughs> Fatness seized the moustache and flung it to the ground dramatically. Well, I don't want to be the groom anymore. I want to be the bride. We stared at her in disbelief, amazed by her impudent challenge to my position. You can't, I finally said. Why not, her fatness demanded. Why should you always be the bride? Why can't someone else have a chance too? Because, Sonali said, joining in, because Arji is the bestest bride of all. But he's not even a girl, her fatness said, closing in on the lameness of Sonali's argument. A bride is a girl, not a boy. She looked around at the other cousins and then at me. A boy cannot be the bride. She said with deep conviction, a girl must be the bride. I stared at her, defenseless in the face of her logic. Fortunately, Sonali, loyal to me as always, came to my rescue. She stepped in between us and said to her fatness, if you can't play properly, go away. We don't need you. 
Yes, Lakshmi and other of my supporters cried. The cousins made bold by the other cousins made bold by Sonali's fearlessness murmured in agreement. Her fatness looked at us all for a moment, and then her gaze rested on me. You're a pansy, she said, her lips curling in disgust. We looked at her blankly. A faggot, she said, her voice rising against her uncomprehending stares. A sissy, she shouted in desperation. It was clear by this time that these were insults. Give me that jacket, Sonali said. She stepped up to her fatness and began to pull at it. We don't like you anymore. Yes, Lakshmi cried. Go away, you fatty boom boom. This was an insult we all understood and we burst out laughing. Someone even began to chant, Hey, fatty boom boom. Hey, fatty boom boom. Her fatness pulled off her coat and trousers. I hate you all, she cried. I wish you were all dead. She flung the groom's clothes on the ground, stalked out of the back garden, and went around the side of the house. We returned to our bridal preparations, chuckling to ourselves over the new nickname we had found for our cousin. When the bride was finally dressed, Lakshmi, the maid of honor, went out of the servant's room to make sure that everything was in place. Then she gave the signal, and the priests and choir boys began to sing, with a certain want of harmony and correct lyrics, the voice that breathed O Eden. Solemnly I made my way down the steps towards the altar that had been set up at one end of the back garden. When I reached the altar, however, I heard the kitchen door open. I turned to see her fatness with her mother, Kantyanti. The discordant singing died out. Kantyanti's eyes were narrowed with anger. Who's calling my daughter fatty, Kantyanti said. She came to the edge of the porch. We stared at her, no one daring to own up. Her gaze fell on me, and her eyes widened for a moment. Then a smile spread across her face. What's this, she said. She came down a few steps and crooked her finger at me. I looked down at my feet and refused to go to her. Come here, come here. Unable to disobey her command any longer, I went. She looked me up and down for a moment, and then gingerly, as if she were examining raw meat at the market, turned me around. What's this you're playing, she asked. It's bride, bride, Auntie Sonali said. Bride, bride, she murmured. Her hand closed on my arm in a tight grip. Come with me. I resisted, but her grip tightened, her nails digging into my elbow. She pulled me up the porch steps and towards the kitchen door. No, I cried. No, I don't want to. Something about the look in her eyes terrified me so much, I did the unthinkable and I hit out at her. This made her hold my arm even more firmly. She dragged me through the kitchen, into the corridor, and towards the drawing room. I felt a heaviness begin to build in my stomach. Instinctively, I knew that Kanthi Auntie had something terrible in mind. As we entered the drawing room, Kanthi Auntie cried out, her voice brimming over with laughter. See what I found! The other aunts and uncles looked up from their papers or bestirred themselves from their sleep. They gazed at me in amazement, as if I had suddenly made myself visible like a spirit. I glanced at them, and then <coughs> at Amma's face. Seeing her expression, I felt my dread deepen. I lowered my eyes. The sari suddenly felt suffocating around my body, and the hairpins which held the veil in place pricked at my scalp. Then the silence was broken by the booming laugh of Sri Lanka, Kanti Auntie's husband. As if she had been hit, Amma swung around in his direction. The other aunts and uncles began to laugh too, and I watched as Amma looked from one to the other like a trapped animal. Her gaze finally came to rest on my father, and for the first time I noticed that he was the only one not laughing. Seeing the way he kept his eyes fixed on his paper, I felt the heaviness in my stomach begin to push its way up. 
my throat. A Chelva Sri Lanka cried out to my father, Looks like you have a funny one here. My father pretended he had not heard and with an inclination of his head indicated to Amma to get rid of me. She waved her hand in my direction and I picked up the edges of my veil and fled to the back of the house. That evening, on the way home, both my parents kept their eyes averted from me. Amma glanced at my father occasionally, but he refused to meet her gaze. Sonali, sensing my unease, held my hand tightly in hers. Later, I heard my parents fighting in their room. How long has this been going on, my father demanded. I don't know, Amma cried defensively. It was as new to me as it was to you. You should have known. You should have kept an eye on him. What should I have done? Stood over him while he was playing? If he turns out funny like that Rancourt Vera boy, if he turns out to be the laughing stock of Colombo, it will be all your fault, my father said in a tone of finality. You always spoil him and encourage all his nonsense. What do I encourage, Amma demanded. You're the one who allows him to come in here while you're dressing and play with your jewelry. Amma was silent in the face of the truth. Of the three of us, I alone was allowed to enter Amma's bedroom and watch her get dressed for special occasions. It was an experience I considered almost religious, for even though I adored the goddesses of the local cinema, Amma was the final statement in female beauty for me. When I knew Amma was getting dressed for a special occasion, I always positioned myself outside her door. Once she had put on her underskirt and blouse, she would ring for our servant Anula to bring her sari, and then while taking it from her, hold the door open so I could go in as well. Entering that room was for me a greater boon than that granted by any god to a mortal. There were two reasons for this. The first was the jewelry box which lay open on the dressing table. With a joy akin to ecstasy, I would lean over and gaze inside, the faint smell of perfume rising out of the box each time I picked up a piece of jewelry and held it against my nose or ears or throat. The second was the pleasure of watching Amma drape her sari watching her shake open the yards of material, which like a Chinese banner caught by the wind would linger in the air for a moment before drifting gently to the floor, watching her pick up one end of it, tuck it into the waistband of her skirt, make the pleats, and then with a flick of her wrists, invert the pleats and tuck them, tuck them into her waistband, and finally watching her drape the palu across her breast <coughs> and pin it into place with a brooch. When Amma was finished, she would check to make sure that the back of the sari had not risen up with the pinning of the palu. They'd move back and look at herself in the mirror. Standing next to her, or seated on the edge of the bed, I too would look at her reflection in the mirror. And with the contented sigh of an artist who has finally captured the exact effect he wants, I would say, you should have been a film star, Amma. A film star, she would cry and lightly smack the side of my head. What kind of a low-class type person do you think I am? One day, about a week after the incident at my grandparents, I positioned myself outside my parents' bedroom door. When Anula arrived with the sari, Amma took it and quickly shut the door. I waited patiently, thinking Amma had not yet put on her blouse and skirt, but the door never opened. Finally, perplexed that Amma had forgotten, I knocked timidly on the door. She did not answer, but I could hear her moving around inside. I knocked a little louder and called out, Amma, through the keyhole. Still no response, and I was about to call her name again when she replied gruffly, Go away. Can't you see I'm busy? I stared disbelievingly at the door. Inside, I could hear the rustle of, sar of the sari as it brushed along the floor. I lifted my hand to knock again, when suddenly I remembered the quarrel I had heard on the night of that last spend the day. 
My hand fell limply by my side. I crept away quietly to my bedroom, sat down on the edge of my bed, and stared at my feet for a long time. It was clear to me that I had done something wrong, <clears throat> but what it was I couldn't comprehend. I thought of what my father had said about turning out funny. The word funny, as I understood it, meant either humorous or strange, as in the expression, that's funny. Neither of these fitted the sense in which my father had used the word, for there had been a hint of disgust in his tone. Later, Amma came out of her room and called Anula to give her instructions for the evening. As I listened to the sound of her voice, I realized that something had changed forever between us. The following spend the day, when Amma came to awaken us, I was already seated in bed folding my bride, bride sari. Something in her expression, however, made me hurriedly return the sari to the bag. What's that, she said, coming towards me, her hand outstretched. After a moment, I gave her the bag. She glanced at its contents briefly. Get up, mister. It's spend the day, she said. Then, with the bag in her hand, she went to the window and looked out into the driveway. The seriousness of her expression, as if I had done something so awful that even the usual punishment of a caning would not suffice, frightened me. I was brushing my teeth after breakfast when our servant Anula came to the bathroom door, peered inside, and said with a sort of grim pleasure, The missy wants to talk to you in her room. Seeing the alarm in my face, she nodded and said, Up to some kind of mischief as usual. Good for nothing, child. My brother Diggy was standing in the doorway of our parents' room, one foot scratching impatiently against the other. Amma was putting on her lipstick. She looked up from the mirror, saw me, and indicated with a tube of lipstick for both of us to come inside and sit on the edge of the bed. Diggy gave me a baleful look. He followed me into the room, his slippers dragging along the floor. Finally, she closed her lipstick, pressed her lips together to even out the color, then turned to us. Okay, mister, she said to Diggy, I'm going to tell you something, and this is an order. He watched her carefully. I want you to include your younger brother on your cricket team. Diggy and I looked at her in shocked silence. Then he cried, Ah, come on, Amma. And I too cried, I don't want to play with them. I hate cricket. I don't care what you want, Amma said. It's good for you. Archie's useless, Diggy said. We'll never win if he's on our team. Amma held up her hand to silence us. That's an order, she said. Why, I asked, ignoring her gesture, why do I have to play with the boys? Why, Amma said, because the sky is so high and pigs can't fly. That's why. Please, Amma, please, I held out my arms to her. Amma turned away quickly, picked up her handbag from the dressing table, and said almost to herself, if the child turns out wrong, it's the mother they always blame, never the father. She clicked the handbag shut. I put my head in my, arms, in my hands and began to sob. Please, Amma, please, I said through my sobs. She continued to face the window. I flung myself on the bed with a wail of anguish, and I waited for her to come like she always did when I cried, waited for her to take me in her arms, rest my head against her breast, and say in her special voice, What's this now? Who's crying? But she didn't hear my, heed my weeping any more than she had heeded my cries when I knocked on her door. Finally, I stopped crying and rolled over on my back. Diggy had left the room. Amma turned to me now that I had become quiet and said cheerfully, You'll have a good time. Just wait and see. Why can't I play with the girls, I replied. You can't, that's all. But why? She shifted uneasily. You're a big boy now and big boys must play with other boys. That's stupid. It doesn't matter, she said. Life is full of stupid things, and sometimes we just have to do them. I won't, I cried defiantly. I won't play with the boys. Her face reddened with anger. 
She reached down, caught me by the shoulders, and shook me hard. Then she turned away and ran her hand through her hair. I watched her, gloating. I had broken her cheerful facade, forced her to show how much it pained her to do what she was doing, how little she actually believed in the justness of her actions. After a moment, uh, she turned back to me and said in an almost pleading tone, You'll have a good time. I looked at her and said, No, I won't. Her back straightened. She crossed the, to the door and stopped. Without looking at me, she said stiffly, The car leaves in five minutes. If you're not in it by then, watch out. I'll stop there. Is this mine or is this yours? I was like, um, <laughs> um, I thought what I'd do is just to break it up a bit because it can be kind of arduous to listen to somebody reading for too long. Uh, that what I would do is I would, I would break it up in this way. I'd read from Funny Boy, then I'd read a little um, amuse bouche, a small piece I wrote. Uh, and then we take questions, and then I read from Cinnamon Gardens and end with another piece on, on food, since we'll be going for dinner. Um, so um, some time ago, the Globe and Mail re ran a series on, I don't know what it was called, I think it was Love or something like that. Um, um, and they, uh, I, you know, they did this kind of um, summer series. And they asked me if I'd write a, an article on it, and uh, so I said, sure. And, uh, the title of the article is International Ménage à Trois. The quarrel began as many lovers' quarrels do over a triviality, getting the milk. By then, Andrew, my partner, had been in Sri Lanka three weeks. It was his first trip to the country that had been my home until I was 19, and which I still consider home at that, which I still considered home at that point, despite 11 years in Canada. I had left that morning to do some research on my second novel, Cinnamon Gardens, and had asked Andrew to get milk from the local store. I got back hot and exhausted to find out that he had not done so. It was accumulation of a growing number of stressors between us, and soon I was yelling at him, listing all the things I had done to make this trip work. And you have not even thanked me for any of it. Thank you, Andrew shouted in response. We had known each other four months, having met at the book launch of my first novel, Funny Boy. Looking up from signing books, I had found before me a devastatingly handsome man with the poetic patrician looks of an Edwardian hero in a merchant ivory film. <laughs> we immediately slipped into an easy intimacy, as if we had known each other all our lives, and we had been going, and we had been going out just a week when we said we loved each other. It was I who suggested that Andrew join me for this, my trip to Sri Lanka. He accepted, and I was overjoyed. He arrived a month after I did, and when I saw him coming through the uh, gate, airport gates, I felt my heart thump in my chest. The first few days were bliss. We had never shared a living space and could not pass each other without kissing. We spent long afternoons in bed holding each other and talking. But then things began to go downhill. What neither Andrew nor I had anticipated was just how foreign he would be in Sri Lanka. How helpless. Nothing summed this up so much as the reason he had not gone to get the milk. For Andrew, just going up our street was a challenge as it involved making his way through a gamut of curious and occasionally hostile stares from the neighbors. Then there was a question of getting across the busy road to the store. Traffic hurtled in both directions, no one respecting the lanes, cars and scooters cutting in and out of it, in and out, everyone ignoring the crosswalk. Poor Andrew could not do what came so naturally to a Sri Lankan, dart to the middle of the road, stand there while the traffic rushed by within an inch of you, then, when there was a small gap, rush across to the other side, signaling all the while madly for the oncoming traffic to slow down or stop. Andrew was also bored and trapped. I was often away doing research, and our rented house was in an isolated suburb. He had nothing to do but read or watch TV programs in a language he did not understand. 
Periodically, a troop of monkeys would come visiting, jumping up and down on the roof, sounding like bombs going off, which further frayed his nerves. And because ne monkeys are often vicious and rabid, um, it made him frightened to go out into the garden. I should have been more sympathetic, more understanding, but Andrew's foreignness scared me. It made, me, it made our relationship seem suddenly frail and impossible. I loved Sri Lanka, and if he could not love and belong in it, how did we work together? Out of fear and despair at losing this person I loved so much, I became angry with him. A simmering tension grew between us, only heightened by the fact that Andrew often had to accompany me to dinner at homes of friends and relatives, dinners at which she would sit in silence, largely ignored, as the rest of us reminisced about the good old days. Finally, Andrew reached the breaking point at a party when one of the female guests took an instant dislike to him and stared at him coldly when introduced because probably she was homophobic and he was a living representation of my sexuality. At dinner, noticing the way he was scooping up the courage with a piece of chapati, she declared with sweet malice, for the whole table to hear. Oh, look, he's making little pizzas. And Andrew later yelled, having informed me that he would not attend another dinner par or party. I was not making little pizzas. I was eating exactly the same as everyone else. Nothing quite tests a relationship like traveling together. It show you, shows you the weakness in your union, but can also strengthen your love. And we did love each other. So once we had let out all the steam we needed to, we sat down to share our feelings and points of view. One of the things this trip to Sri Lanka was making us realize was that we were really in a menage a trois. Andrew, me, and Sri Lanka. We were both understanding that the longing and passion an immigrant feels for the country he has left takes up a lot of emotional space. We had to learn to negotiate and co cope with this third element in our relationship. Once we had come to understand this, our relationship got even better. Andrew joined my father's club, where he would relax by the pool while I rushed up about town doing my research. I began to say no to some of the dinner invitations. We looked forward to our ritual gin and tonic at the club, watching the Indian uh, sunset over the Indian Ocean, Andrew filling me in on the gossip and goings on of the expat community which he ob observed and listened to while lying by the pool. Soon he was falling in love with Sri Lanka too. In the years to come, we would make many trips back, even spending a whole year there. Andrew would soon be crossing the street in true Sri Lankan style. Questions? Yes. Um, do you have a leadership in Sri Lanka? A large body of excited fans? I don't know about, exa I don't know about a large body, <laughs> but I, I do have a, 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 a leadership in Sri Lanka, largely because the book is taught in the university curriculum, and also now I find out in, I've heard out in the high school curriculum. So. There are always a generation of young people before years who encounter the book and who are always uh, really pleased to meet me, and I'm really pleased to meet them. So I always um, never turn down an invitation to go to a university and talk to people, uh, talk to the students. So yes, it's, um, it's nice. And I, now it's been translated into Sinhalese. Um, so I do periodically get letters which I can't actually read properly. So. I usually get somebody to help me with the translation. And they're just from young people, young or even older people who are gay and who have read the book and feel they recognize themselves in it. So. How do you not I think I appear in all sorts of companies. I mean, gay anthologies, Sri Lankan anthologies, South Asian anthologies, anthologies of the diaspora, 
immigrant anthologies, um, um, yeah, anthologies on childhood, <laughs> you know, gender, etc. So yeah, no, no foodies. No, no, no foodies. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, you know, I don't do it that well. I mean, I don't. That's not a speciality. Yes. And I was wondering, did, did you write for this short story originally, or did you write it continuously as a narrative? Well, what happened was that I had, I had um, well, the whole story is that I moved to Montreal for a year, taking all my savings, mm -hmm. intending to write a novel. So I wrote a novel, and it was an absolute failure, and I never even bothered sending it out. And then I suddenly was in this position where I you know, spent all my savings, and I did not know what to do. So I had a job in a video store. And um, I would sort of, um, I started sort of doodling, really, you know, writing, doodling. And I just began this writing exercise of a boy, uh, just a boy watching his mother put on her sari. And then by the end of the page, I realized that he wanted to wear the sari. And then from that, I wrote this short story that's a, that I read from. That was the first story in Funny Boy. And then at the end of the story, I realized that this goes on. The story goes on. And so then I figured that I have to find a way to do it. And then uh, round about that time, I, I had read Alice Munro's Lives of Girls and Women, which is also interlinked short stories. So then it was suddenly very obvious to me what the structure was. So it, I just basically um, then figured out that at that point, the... the um, the, the, the political background needed to start to seep into the text. So then I found a way to gradually sort of increase the amount of political um, stuff on, in the text. I mean, basically what happens is that the danger begins to circle the family and draws closer and closer and closer until finally it's, it's sort of at their doorstep, literally. And so I just wanted to do that. But, um, I mean, I don't really have a talent for... Um, for writing those dramatic scenes like, you know, a, a riot or a, So I, my technique was to keep it off stage. I mean, you know, actually when you read Funny Boy, you never ever see the violence on stage. It's always off stage. And so it, what it makes you do is it makes you contemplate the effect of the violence rather than the violence itself, which no film adaptation so far or attempted film, film adaptation has got right. I mean, I've seen so many scripts for this um, book and it always starts off with a big bomb going off, a big <laughs> shootout. And I think, oh, God, this is going to be, a, I know from page one, it's a disaster. Because so, nobody seems to get that, that, that it falls apart if you let the violence into the, te into the story. Yes? The next the book you wrote from last night is also um, situated in Sri Lanka? Yes. Do you have anything that's situated in Canada? Yes, the, the book actually crosses over into Canada. Okay, just yeah. so it's kind yeah. of dual, dual Yes, dual. yeah. Okay. It goes between the two countries. So, Yes. About about the about the passage itself. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I know that the book is also done here in 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 in, in Canada, in, in Toronto in particular, in the high school system, but probably at a lower level than it would be done in Sri Lanka. So I mean, at a, at a younger age. So yes, I I do hear that people identify with the character. Um, and there's often a you know discussion about that uh, when I go to read in high schools uh, around that. Um, but it seems to be yeah. So did you ever expect this kind of response or identification with the character? I sort of did, and I sort of I mean I, I mean I hoped that people would identify with the character. I mean, for me, the, the purpose of the book was that I grew up in Sri Lanka when there was absolutely 
no knowledge for me about who I was, and I wanted to break the silence. So it was very clear to me that that was one of the things I wanted to do. But I wanted to do it in my way, which was in this sort of nuanced, uh, fictional way rather than in a non-fictional way. Um, because I suppose I believe it, it, it goes deeper, to, you know, it goes deeper when to the reader. It sort of, you know, goes deeper. It's my belief. So that's yes. Well, I don't tend to read reviews generally, <laughs> so I'm not uh, really any. Sense yeah, I mean, of use the negative too. Yeah. I mean, I guess with, um, dealing with the, the, the gay part of the book or any of that nature. Right? You know, uh, um, I think that I think that I think that they're, that they're sort of um, being kind of grumblings about it, you know, but not the kind of um, overt sort of. Um, sort of violence done to the book that we saw with sort of Rohingya Mysteries fine balance or whatever in Bombay there's been no book burning or you know anything anything like that it just it seems to have um, I mean you know for the Sri Lankan reader what was so um, when the book came out what was so um, incredible was to see the, uh, a description of the, the, that part of the, the communal the sort of the violence of communal violence in a book, they had not seen that before, so it was sort of a, it was sort of a mostly seen that the gay theme fell up, like it was sort of a very uh, minor theme for them. I mean, people uh, weren't killing each other on the street because they were gay or straight; they were killing each other on the street because they were Tamil and Sinhalese, and so it was kind of this, um, like this absolute. People were really drawn to that and, and talked a lot about that and discussed it a lot and. Um, um, and then it just came at, the book came out at the exact same moment when there had been a government change. And so there was this, you know, the, the, there was a ceasefire, there was this incredible sense of hope. Um, and, um, you know, then it sort of got, all that got lost. But at that moment there was this, the book sort of represented this moment because that, that president who came in, to her credit, no matter what she didn't do, was completely believed in the idea that the, that now the past had to be looked at, had to be examined, that there had to be commissions before Sri Lanka could move forward. So it was part of that, you know, it just got sort of swept up in that movement of we can examine the past and move forward. Yeah. Um, anything else? All right, I'll read from Cinnamon Gardens. Um, Cinnamon Gardens is a historical novel. It's set in the year 1927, and Bar Linton, one of the main characters in Cinnamon Gardens, is, I suppose, a man you could say has it all. The wealthy son of a land-owning feudal aristocrat, the Mudaliya Navaratna, Bar Linton lives in a beautiful villa by the sea. He will never in his life want for material comfort, never have to worry like some of us do about a job or paying the rent. His wife, Sonia, is both beautiful and intelligent, the kind of woman many men would give their right arm to have as a wife. Sonia is also Barlington's cousin. <coughs> She's of mixed race, her mother being British. Sonia was orphaned as a small child and was raised in Ingle, England by her aunt, Lady Ethel Boxton. Barlington and Sonia have a son, a charming, intelligent, loving young man. So Barlington, at 40, is a man who seems to have the world at his feet. Yet there dwells in Barlington's life a terrible secret. Twenty years ago he was sent to England for his higher education. While there he fell in love with a fellow student named Richard Howler. Richard and he lived together as a couple for a few years. Their happiness, however, was brought to a brutal end by Barlington's father, the Mudalia. The Mudalia, who learned of their relationship through a fellow Ceylonese student, turned up at their flat one day. When he started in on them, Barlington fled the house in an act of cowardice, leaving Richard to face his father. At first, Richard tried to stand up to the Mudalia, but when the Mudalia threatened to call the police and have Richard charged with sodomy, Richard was forced to physically get down on his knees and beg the Mudalia's forgiveness. 
this would have been soon after the Os Oscar Wilde trial, so as you can imagine, Richard was very nervous. Soon after, soon after Balindran married Sonia, who had just arrived back in England from finishing school in France. In the 20 years that have passed, Balindran, a father himself, has convinced himself that his father did the right thing, that he's happier now than he would have been if he had continued life as an invert, as gay men were known in that time. He knows that his inversion is not something that will ever go away, yet he feels he has learned to live with it. It is, in his words, a familiar impediment like a pair of glasses or a badly set fracture. At the beginning of the novel, Balendron learns that Richard used to visit Ceylon, Sri Lanka was called Ceylon at that point, with the Donomo Commission, a constitutional commission that has been appointed to study the granting of independence from the British. Balendron learns his news through, of all people, his father. The Mudalia is worried about the commission, especially the possibility that it might grant universal franchise, which is the granting of the right to vote to every adult, irrespective of race, class, gender, etc. Universal franchise would displace him as a member of the feudal aristocracy. The Mudalia wants Balindran to convince Richard to convince the commission not to grant um, universal franchise. Balindran is at first surprised that his father wants him to renew contact with Richard. Yet, rather than seeing his father's request as self-serving, he comes to see his father's directive as a sign that his father completely trusts him, thinks he is completely cured. And now to Balindran and Richard's first meeting after 20 years, and uh, Richard has come with um, his partner, uh, Mr. Alliston, who's called Ali for short. Balindran and his wife Sonia sat in the lounge. Even though it was only mid-November, the hotel had already put out its Christmas decorations. As Sonia chatted away about how incongruous and silly the fake holly and mistletoe looked in the tropics, Balindran found himself gazing out over golf face cream. He thought of that walk he had taken across the green two weeks ago, just after his father had told him of Richard's arrival. All the rationalizations he had used to convince himself that this meeting would be painless, even banal, seems senseless now in the face of this impending encounter. From where Barlington was sitting, he could see into the foyer of the hotel where a great wooden staircase rose up to the second floor. To the left of the staircase was the lift. The door to the lift now swung open and Richard stepped out. Balindran rose to his feet and stared at Richard. How much older he looked! How changed! His friend had seen him and he started to come across the foyer. Richard, so slim in his youth, had become heavy set, especially around the jaws. His hair was thinning out and had receded halfway up his head. It was the face of a middle-aged man. Balindran felt a sudden pang of sadness, for there in Richard's face, like the physical distance between them across the foyer, were the missing years of their lives. Richard was now in front of Balindran. Bala, he said gruffly, and extended his hand. Balindran took it, but could not speak for a moment because of the sadness in him. Richard. Their gaze met, and in that instant Richard saw that Balindran's eyes were unguarded. His own defensiveness fell away. As he held each other's hands, there passed between them the understanding of their history together, of the life that had been theirs. It settled on them like fine dust. Sonia had risen from a seat now, and Balindran let go of Richard's hand. This is my wife, Sonia, Balindran said, turning to her. Richard saw with surprise that she was of mixed blood. Her hairstyle was modern. 
She was holding out her hand and he took it. Pleased to meet you, they both said at the same time and then smiled at their synchronization. And this is my friend, Mr. Alliston, Richard said, and turned towards Ali, who was standing a little away from them. He came forward and offered his hand to Sonia first, since she was the woman in their party. This gave Barney a moment to look him over. How young he is, he thought immediately, and then was careful not to let the surprise show on his face. Miss Allison had turned to him now. Barlinan shook his hand and said warmly, Welcome to Ceylon. I hope you have a very pleasant stay here. They all stood for a moment, not knowing what to say next. Well, shall we, Richard said, and pointed in the direction of the garden. The Gorface Hotel garden opened directly onto the beach. The upper part of the lawn was a terrace with wrought iron tables and wicker chairs for tea. As they came into the garden, they could hear music wafting down from the ballroom gallery upstairs. The band was playing a jaunty Charleston. When they were all seated on the terrace and had ordered tea, there was an awkward pause. Then Richard and Barlendron spoke at the same time. I must say it was a surprise. It's impossible to believe your... Richard indicated for Barlendron to speak first. It's impossible to believe you're actually in Ceylon. When we heard you were traveling here with the commission, we were surprised. I couldn't think of a worse position to be in. The political situation here is more complex than I could have ever imagined. Yes, Barlendron said, relieved that they had found something to discuss, something that would alleviate the awkwardness. It's a complex society with numerous horizontal and uh, divisions. It's going to be very hard to find a constitution that works. Still, one must hope. I don't know how this commission dares to think they can make a reasoned recommendation in such a short period of time, Richard said. Well, that's the British for you, Ali said. Think they can barge in and tell everyone what to do, then act put out when their brilliant solutions don't work. Here, here, Sonia said. I'm with Mr. Alliston on that. I think both of you are a bit harsh on the British, Richard said. They are, after all, trying their best to remedy past wrongs. Rubbish, Ali replied. They are trying to have their cake and eat it. Mark my word, this commission's recommendations will make sure the British continue to have their way. Ali stood up now, bored with the conversation. Where are you going, Richard asked quickly. Down to the bottom of the garden to look at the sea. I'll come with you, Mr. Alliston, Sonia said and stood up. I always loved the view from there. Barlinden, Barlinden was alarmed that she was going, leaving them alone, but Miss Allison had already held out his arm to Sonia gallantly. She took it and they began to walk down the steps, chatting to each other. Barlinden caught Richard's glance and he saw that his friend was feeling as uneasy as he was. Your wife... She's charming, Richard said after a moment. Where did you meet her? We met in London at... Barlington paused. We met at her aunt's house. Barlington stared at him in surprise. He looked down the garden at Sonia, a disturbing thought forming in his mind. Why you were a student there, he asked. Barlington moved in his chair uncomfortably. Richard, let's not dwell on the past. An uncomfortable silence fell between them, punctured by Richard tapping his pencil on his notebook and the sound of the band upstairs playing a soulful ballad. On the way home, Sonia turned to Barlinden in the car and said, I like Mr. Allison very much. At first his indolent manner was off-putting, but I think he has a lot of sense. Sees things with remarkable clarity. He's good for your friend Mr. Howland. Keeps him from hoisting the British flag too high. She leant back in her seat and folded her arms. And so good looking too. It's funny how those sorts always are. Even Mr. Howland, you can tell he was... A quick movement from Barlington made her break off and look at him. He was staring at her in astonishment. Bala, darling, she said and took his hand smiling. Surely you could tell, couldn't you? Tell what, Barlendon said, trying to conceal his fear. They are, you know, inverts. Friends of Oscar's, my Aunt Ethel used to say. Barlendon withdrew his hand from hers. 
Don't be cross, Sonia. What a terrible thing to say about someone you claim to like. Besides, how could you tell? There was nothing that indicated that. Perhaps some of us are more astute than others, Sonia replied. Then she added, it was the difference in their ages. Besides, Mr. Alliston is a little outre, as our theatre would say. Balindran looked out of the window, and after a few moments, he realized that his heart was beating furiously. <coughs> that evening, Balindran retired to his study under the auspices of working on some business affairs. But he sat at his desk, thinking of the meeting with Richard. It shocked him that Sonia had discerned what he had never expected she would, that Sonia actually knew what inversion was. Friends of Oscar, her aunt had called him, a thing he would have thought beyond the pale of refined society, beyond the understanding of decent women. Yet they were both decent women, ladies, and their knowing such a thing took him aback. Palindrum sighed as he thought of Richard's question about Sonia. Everything had gone fairly well until that moment. Now he regretted having uh, cut him off so abruptly. He could have easily said something like, No, I met her after you left, alluding indirectly to their relationship and separation, and not leaving Richard with the false impression that he had been unfaithful. He shook his head at his own stupidity. Ballantyne found, found himself thinking of the first time he had seen Richard coming across the lawn of Lincoln's Inn, his gown flapping out behind him. It had been a fine autumn day, and he, Ballantyne, had been leaning on the balustrade, too lazy to go into the library and study. He had watched Richard come up the steps, and Richard, looking up, had seen him too. Hello, Richard had said, as if they had met before. Hello, Ballantyne had replied shyly. Care for a tea or coffee? Ballantyne had nodded. Ballinden wondered even to this day how Richard had simply glanced at him and seen his desire, he who was so very careful not to be detected watching men. He thought of the shock of blonde hair that fell over Richard's forehead in those days, the charming way he had of tossing it at his head to get it off his face, pulling it back tightly when contemplating a dilemma, dilemma blowing it away from his eyes when he was tired or exasperated. He wondered if Richard had got used to not having that shock of hair, if he still tossed his head or ran his hand up his forehead forgetfully. I'll stop there. Um, if you have a few minutes, and I just thought, you know, it's sort of, I don't know if anybody had any questions about um, that reading um, so that I could, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, answer them before we move on, before we move on. Yes? What strikes me about your work, and, and that particular novel, yeah. um, is how very much, uh, it's a very feminist novel, I might say, because it's not just that the personal is political, the political is always personal. Yes. And, um, of course, <coughs> in, in, we haven't time to expand on that, but the subplot of, of the lost brother, and the sort of not just the feudal, but the patriarchal kind of uh, violence that the father um, inflicts on his family. So is there anything that can be said about that? There's a, specific, there's a lot yeah. of feminism in it. Yeah, there is a lot of feminism, but I, I mean, I think we, we, we sort of take, we, we do tend to take for granted what feminism gave to us. I mean, we sort of forget that it was actually sort of feminists who came up with the idea of the political is personal. But by the time the gay movement was in full fledged, yeah, yeah, full spate, that was just except the norm. The polit you know, the political was personal. Um, so, uh, you know, when I came out, it was still not, you know, it wasn't the dark ages in Canada, but it wasn't exactly great either. So, um, you know, you had to sort of be politically involved. You had, you had to take responsibility for yourself in a certain way. And then, you know, then there was the identity politics movement, where again it was, the, you know, the political was personal. Um, so I participated in that as well. So it was very much ingrained in, in me as a kind of uh, thought process that just would be in the work. And I, I always was very attracted to fiction that had some political um, element to it. And I, but to me, although I must say that politics to me is like, politics to fiction to me is, is like salt to food. You know, 
if you don't have enough, it's insipid. If you have too much, it spoils the flavor. So it's always trying to get that correct balance. Um, and of course, the patriarchal structure was very was a very oppressive thing for me as a gay person, both in Sri, both in Sri Lanka and in Canada. And so I was very conscious of it, um, and I was very conscious of the combination of of patriarchy and caste and class in, in the Sri Lankan context, which also really plays out in that in that story of the lost brother, which is part of the novel. I won't give it away, uh, but um, there's a, he has a brother who's exiled from the country by his father uh, for marrying a lower caste woman. But then you find out there's some complications in the plot. Um, so um, it's just I, I just wanted to really express that and and. Um, sort of um, be a traitor to my sex from within, if you know what I mean, <laughs> which is, I think, the way people put it. And Funny Boy also, I mean, um, really sort of goes at that, especially in the last story, which is set in a private school like the one I went to, where basically the boys of the boys who will go on to leave the country are fashioned in a brutal way, and then you sort of realize, well, of course the country is brutal. This is what they learned school. This is how, you know, the, the lesson that we all learned at school was that when you have power, you use it um, as you wish. And so that was what we learned at school. So we took it out into the real world. So that's very important to me as part of my belief structure. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I was going to just say, I mean, and it's sometimes since I've read the novel, which I really enjoyed, but I don't have a, a full memory of it. But I, I was curious when you talked about a little bit earlier about the research you were doing um, for the novel. And obviously, a historical novel needs more research. And I was curious, especially about there's this um, part of it where there's this sort of queer community of artists yes. who live together. Yes. In, and was that actually a real community, or was that part invented? <coughs> it, it was invented. It, it happened about um, 15 years later. Okay. Yeah. Um, with this very you know, quite a few famous artists. And it was not just queer, but it was also everything, you know, everything coming together. And um, I felt that that it was possible to extrapolate back from that. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, there was a fair amount of, of radical stuff going on in Sri Lanka at that point. And, um, you know, subsequently, after Cinnamon Gardens was published, Somebody told me, uh, it was probably something like this, you know, reading. Some academic told me that he was doing a piece, or he, had, he was doing some research on this man, this British guy, who was caught in a railway carriage um, in Sri Lanka, uh, sort of, you know, in a compromising position with some young men. And then he was, he was a very, um, actually he was a very well-known uh, military guy, you know, like an army guy. So he was being brought back for court-martial, and then he shot himself on the way. But what was interesting, and actually this, the person must have been Sri Lanka, but what this person told me that was very interesting was she, she said, when you, or he said, or she said, when you look at the names of the men he was with, they're all from the, uh, from the first families, you see? She said, you know, we record, she said, and she listed off the names of the, you know, the, the, the family names. And I said, really, how interesting. There must have been something going on for, these, yeah, yeah. for this British guy to meet these people. I mean, these aren't, you know, boys he's picked up on the, you know, yeah, yeah. they're not trade, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I thought that there was just, that they had, there was something there, and I was kind of trying to dig at it. And the other thing um, that I... Um, discovered was that, and actually that was the inspiration for, for Balindran, was that the father of the, um, also sort of the, the, the guy who founded the Ceylon National Congress, Arunachalam, who led the kind of movement towards independence, um, had had a very close and continuing friendship with Edward Carpenter, and used to visit Carpenter in his house in um, Sheffield, uh, Car Edward Carpenter is, is sort of like a really early gay activist and is a role model for A.M. Forrester's Maurice. Um, and he, um, so I just thought that that was interesting that this man would visit this house where, which, where clearly there was lots of sex going on uh, in um, Carpenter's house. So I just, and he was also in his correspondence, or the little bit I saw of his correspondence, very frank and 
intimate with the carpenter in the way that, you know, like a man, a statesman shares his sort of um, real feelings with very, very few people because, you know, he can't really. I mean, he has to be very careful. Whom he, and so um, I thought that that was interesting that, I mean, I don't know if I don't know if I have no idea. He was married and he had children and all that. But just this little bit of information kind of made me, intrigued me that you know, I could do something interesting fiction-wise. Any other questions? It was a lot of fun to research that book. I have to say, I just really got into it. And uh, I had an old aunt who um, remembered all the saris from the, that era. You know, she just gave me a list of the saris. And then she, um, and then I would call her periodically and say, this is the woman, uh, what would she wear? And then she'd say, well, Lady so-and-so, Lady Roger Parkson, had a black sar silk sari with, you know, and then it was like, okay, hold on, I'm writing it down right now. <laughs> she was great. And then she actually had kept menus from the dinners her parents would give in their home. So it was really... Uh, I just love, I just really can, I think some, I think that it's, that's a bit too much of that information in the book, frankly. That you can really tell the writer sort of fallen in love with the detail, unfortunately. Okay, so um, I think we should just stop now because it's 6.15 and I'm sure people want to, you know, have dinner. So, thank you.